Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In module 1, we introduced various aspects of data mining, data simulation and prediction and their relations to other branches of science and engineering. This course is a mathematically oriented course on data simulation. So, we are going to provide all the mathematical tools and techniques that would be needed to be able to pursue research and education in data assimilation areas. With that in mind, in module 2, we have several sub modules. In 2.1, we are going to quickly review the concepts of finite dimensional vector spaces. The notion of finite dimensional vector spaces is fundamental to performing any computational process. In module 2.2, we are going to be talking about all the results that one would need from matrix theory and then we will review concepts from multivariate calculus. Then as a last part in this module, we will also review some of the basic principles from optimization theory. So, a strong grounding in basic understanding in financial vector space matrix theory multivariate calculus and optimization tools and techniques are fundamental to any serious pursuit of data simulation. So, we will start with a quick review of fundamental principles from finite dimensional vector spaces. I am also going to use this module to set up all of our notations and basic concepts. So, R is a set of real numbers, they are also called real scalars. C is a set of complex numbers, it is called complex scalars. Rn, R to the power n refers to a set of all real vectors of size n. C of n, set of all complex vectors of size n. We are giving some examples now. X belong to Rn implies X is a vector with n components. The components are written column wise each of the component x i is a real number, 0 is a vector, 0 vector consists of all zeros is called a null vector. When n is 3, here is an example of a vector 3.21.59.9, 3.2 is the x 1, 1.5 is x 2, 9.9 .9 is x 3. Here is an example of a complex vector. In a complex vector again there are n components, each component is a complex number. So, first one is x 1 plus i y 1, the ith one is x i plus i y i and x n plus i y uh, y n is the nth element of the complex vector. Here x i and y i are real numbers, i is the unit imaginary number square root of minus 1. Here is an example of a complex vector 1 plus i, 1 minus i, 1 minus 2 i, this is a complex vector of size 3. Even though we talked about complex as well as real uh, spaces of vectors, largely in this course we will deal with real spaces especially R to the n. I am going to quickly review some of the concepts from operations on vectors. X, Y, Z be vectors, let A, B, C be vectors. Uh, uh, I am sorry, there is an error. A, B, C belongs to r not to r to the n. So, there is an error we will we will correct that. x is a vector, y is a vector, z is a vector. z is a sum of x and y or difference of x and y. z i is the ith component. So, z i is either sum of the two components or the difference of the two components. This is called vector addition, vector subtraction. y is equal to a times x, a is a scalar. So, this is called scalar multiplication of a vector y i is equal to a times x i scalar multiplication of a vector x by a scalar a. Z 
is equal to a x plus y in this case ith component z i is equal to a times x i plus y i uh, this is called sax p scalar times the vector plus a vector. So, these are the basic operations and vectors that we will be dealing with. Now, I would like to introduce the notion of what is called a vector space let v denote a collection of real vectors of size n for this v to be called a linear space or a vector space or a linear vector space there are several names associated with it if it satisfies the following three condition. The first condition is v 1 is a group under addition what does it mean if I took any vectors in v that sum is also in v it is closed under addition. This operation of vector addition is also associative. So, if I am given three vectors x plus y plus z in order to find please remember addition is a binary operation I can only add two numbers at a given time. So, if I are given three vectors I have to make two additions you do one at a time either you add y plus z and to the sum you add x or you add x plus y to the sum you add z such a property is called associative property of addition. So, what does associative property essentially tells you the order in which you add does not affect the results of the comp computation. V contains a 0 vector what is the property of 0 vector if you add 0 to any vector it remains the vector does not change x plus 0 is 0 plus x is equal to x for all x. For every vector x there is a unique y such that x plus y is equal to y plus x is equal to 0 that is called additive inverse of x and y is called minus x. Any collection of vectors that satisfies these properties closed under addition it is an associative property it contains a 0 vector and it is it, it also has an additive inverse such a, um, a set is called a group. So, v first be a group second one there are properties that to say scalar multiplication a times x if you if, if x belongs to v a x also belongs to v. So, that means any vector if you multiply by a constant it is in the same set. If a and b are two scalars you can multiply the vector x by b and then by a that is equal to multiplying a and b and then multiplying with x that is again a kind of an associated with respect to scalar multiplication. 1 times x is x so 1 is the real number 1 if you multiply any vector by the number 1 it does not change is, a, is itself. The third property is called distributivity property a times x plus y is equal to a times x plus a times y for all x and y. So, first one is scalar multiplication distributes itself with respect to addition the second one is scalar addition distributes itself with respect to vector multiplication by a vector. So, a plus b times x is a x plus b x for all x. So, any collection of vectors that satisfy these three properties c 1 c 2 c 3 is said to constitute what is called a linear space a vector space or a linear vector space. For all computations there must underlie always a finite dimensional vector space as the ba as, 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 as a base on which it is all the computations are done. So, this is the general definition of what a vector space is vector space comes in various shapes and forms the set of all real numbers is the vector space it satisfies all the properties the set of all real satisfy these properties is the vector space set of all complex vectors satisfy all the things the set of all n by n real matrices is a vector space set of all polynomials of degree n is a vector space. If you have sequence infinite sequence such that the sum of the squares is finite it is called square summable sequence the set of all square summable infinite sequences they also form a vector space. The set of all continuous functions over an interval a b is also a vector space. So, you can see vector space of functions vector space of sequences vector space of polynomials vector space of matrices vector space of complex numbers real numbers and real vectors. So, vector spaces are abundant every one of these vector spaces constitute the basis for uh, computational processes and data simulation is largely a computational problem because I need to be able to estimate fit the model 
is the solving an inverse problem being a computational problem why must always uh, be concerned with what is the vector space in which I am performing all these computations. I am now going to quickly review uh, operations on vectors. Some of you who have taken a course in linear algebra may already know this. I am assuming that all the people who are going to be reading this may not have the same background and so to bring uniformity in the reader um, I, am, I am going to quickly review many of these concepts. So, let x y z be 3 vectors a b c be 3, real num 3, 3 real numbers. I am going to introduce this bracket notation opening bracket dot comma dot closing bracket that is going to be a binary operation on vectors. So, that binary operation in here is called an inner product. So, parenthesis inner product y x and y defines an inner product which is defined as x transpose y which is defined as sum of x i y i. x i y i is also equal to y i x i because multiplication of real numbers is commutative. So, that is equal to y transpose x is equal to y comma x. So, this means the inner product I am not only defining the inner product but I am also showing the inner product as an intrinsic property it is symmetric. So, the symmetry property. So, the properties of inner product x dot y is greater than 0 if x is not equal to 0 it is 0 only if x is equal to 0. So, this y must be this y must be x one second I will I'll tell that now this y must be x then the definition is correct. Uh, so, uh, inner product of x with itself is greater than 0 when x is not 0 inner product of x is with the x is 0 only when x is 0 that is called a positive definite property. We have already seen the symmetric property inner product is also additive inner product of x plus y with z is inner product of x with z inner product of y, uh, y with z the sum of the two inner product is said to be homogeneous what does it mean if I multiply one of the components by a constant a. So, inner product of a x comma y is a times inner product of x and y it is also the same as x times inner product of a y that is called the homogeneity property. If the inner product of x and z and y and z are equal for all z then x and y must be equal that is again another fundamental property of, of inner product. We will use all these properties in developing a joint technique or joint methods when we do 4D war methods. When x and y belong to C n the inner product is defined by x i y i bar y i bar is the complex conjugate of y. So, the inner product definition has to be appropriately modified when you go from real domain to the complex domain. Since we are going to be dealing only with the real domain these 5 properties of inner product are sufficient for our purposes. Now, I am going to define other operations and vectors x is a vector y is a vector by vector I always mean a column vector. So, y transpose is a row vector. So, x y transpose is the product between a column a column vector and a row vector the product of column vector row a vector is called an outer product of two vectors the result is a matrix x 1 y 1 x 1 y 2 x n y n and so on you can see the elements of the matrix coming in here. So, the outer product can be written in many ways the first column is a multiple of the vector x by y 1 the second column is the multiple of x by y 2 the last column is a multiple of x by y n likewise I can also consider as a, as, as, as a multiples of rows. The first row is the multiple of the row y with x 1 the second row is the multiple of the row y with x 2 the last row is the multiple of the row y with x n. So, I can think of it as a matrix or multiples of column x or multiples of row y all these are properties of the outer product of matrices outer product of matrices is a fundamental operation. The next one is called the norm of x and the notion of a distance. The norm of x is denoted by x within that sign two vertical 
to the left, two vertical to the right. A vector is one object, the norm of a vector is another object, the norm is a scalar associated with every vector there is a norm, norm is a measure of the size of the vector, the size of the vector is denoted as a, as a scalar. The norm of the vectors arises in many ways, one is called the Euclidean norm, another is called the Manhattan norm, another is called Chebyshev norm, another is called the Minsk Minkowski's norm, another is called the energy norm. The Euclidean norm is a standard one that comes from the Pythagorean theorem. The norm of x is equal to square root of the sum of the squares of x. That can also be expressed as square root of the inner product of x with the x. The Manhattan norm or one norm is essentially sum of the absolute values of x. I would like to be able to bring the distinction between Manhattan norm and the and the uh, uh, Euclidean norm. So, if I have a two dimensional plane, if I have a point here, if this is x 1, this is x 2, the Euclidean norm refers to this distance and th what is the value of this distance? This distance is equal to x 1 square plus x 2 square to the power half. That comes from the length of the hypotenuse is this is x 1, this is x 2 is a right angle triangle with two sides x 1 and x 2 that is the length of the hypotenuse. So, that is the 2 norm. The 1 norm on the other hand is if I want to go from 0 to this point I have to go by x 1 then I have to go by x 2 it is sum of the distances from 0 to there. Let us talk about this now suppose you have to go so let us assume this is the point O this is the point P. If I want to go by a taxi from point O to point B I will first go along the street to the east and then I will go along the street to the north. So, the total distance traveled by a taxi cab is x 1 plus x 2, but if I had a helicopter I could fly directly from 0 to p and that is the Euclidean norm. So, that is the two ways of differentiating the two norms. Chebyshev norm is called the infinitely norm and that is Chebyshev is a famous Russian mathematician and he defined the norm to be the maximum of the absolute values of i that is another useful uh, definition of, of, of a norm. Minkowski another mathematician from Russia he defined what is called a p norm. The norm of p is given by what is that you need to do? You take the absolute value of each component raise it to the power p it is the p so 1 o p th root of the sum of the p th powers of the absolute values of x. I hope that is clear from the expression. We will often talk about another uh, useful in, in meteorology when we talk about um, 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 error growth and other things it is called energy norm. Energy norm of a uh, of, of a vector x with respect to a matrix a is defined to be x transpose a x to the power half a in this case is a symmetric positive definite matrix. So, norm refers to the size size can be measured in many ways there are at least 5 different ways I have illustrated one can measure the size of a vector width. Once I have a size I have the notion of a distance. So, if x and y are 2 points the distance between x and y is simply the norm of the difference of the 2 vectors x is a vector y is a vector difference of a vector is a vector I can turn to the norm of the vector. So, the distance between 2 vectors is simply the norm of the vector associated with the difference uh, uh, with, the, with the difference. What are the general properties of norm? You can define norm any way you want. No one is going to be able to come and dictate that this should be the only way to be able to design norm. So, if you want to define your own norm I am going to tell you what are the basic properties a norm must possess. So, given a vector x n of x is a norm if it satisfies the following 3 conditions n of x must be positive definite n of x must be homogeneous. In other words the norm of a scalar multiple of a x is simply a times the norm of x that is called a homogeneous. The third property of the norm is that the sum of the norm of the sum of the 2 vectors is less than or equal to norm of x plus norm of y that is called the triangle inequality that is called the triangle inequality. So, the norm should be positive definite a norm must be homogeneous a norm must satisfy the triangle inequality. I would like to 
point out that every norm that we define the phi norms we define all of them satisfy these properties. In addition to these phi you can define your own norm you can any norm that you want to use must satisfy these three conditions. Now um, a special note Euclidean norm is very special because Euclidean norm is the only norm that can be derived from inner product. Of the phi norms only Euclidean norm is associated with the inner product and nothing else. Then I'm, I have a homework here verify that the norm square of the, of the sum plus norm square of the difference is 2 times the square of the norm of x plus square of the norm of y. So, this must be norm of y one second this must be norm of y. So, so that is that rule is a very basic rule that is called the parallelogram law any uh, uh, the, the, the norm based on the Euclidean uh, 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 definition always satisfies this parallelogram law. Then the notion of what is called a unit sphere comes into play. The unit sphere in 2 norm is given here please remember 2 norm is called the Euclidean norm. The unit sphere is, is, is in 1 norm takes this shape 1 norm is the, uh, is, is the Manhattan norm this is the conventional geometric norm this is the infinity norm the unit sphere in the infinity. So, what is the unit sphere? Unit sphere is a set is the locus of points which are at unit distance from the origin. So, if you take a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin if the circle is defined as a locus of all points at constant distance of 1 from the origin. So, if you pick the norm to be the equality norm that is the circle. The circle becomes this trapezoid when you change the norm. The trapezoid becomes a square if you change the norm. The, the, the unit circle becomes an ellipsoid if I change the norm. So, when you pick a matrix A to be 5 0 0 1 that is a symmetric positive definite matrix. If you consider the square of this norm you get the, an equation to an ellipse which is given by here x 1 square by a square plus x 2 square by b square is equal to 1 is an equation to an ellipse. So, you can readily see the equation to the ellipse is depicted here. So, what is why, why, why am I doing this? I want you to um, understand that the geometrical figures naturally morphs the shapes changes if you change the definition of a norm. Again I want to insist here uh, mathematics is a man made science you have total freedom to do whatever you want the only condition is you must be consistent. So, for a norm to be consistent you have to satisfy those three, three rules. So, consistent with those three rules we have seen several different norms and this is one way to geometrically explain the intrinsic differences between the properties of these norms. Then you have the notion of what is called the unit vector. A unit vector in the direction x is simply x divided by the norm of x we all know that very well. Then there are a couple of fundamental inequalities one is called uh, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality what does it say? If I have an inner product between x and y the value of the inner product by definition is x transpose y and that is equal to the norm of x norm of y times the cosine of the angle between the two that is the cosine of theta. Cosine of theta is always less than one, less than or equal to 1 therefore, this product is always less than or equal to product of the norm of x and norm of y. So, this inequality namely inner product of x and y is less than or equal to the product of the norms of x and y that inequality is called cauchy schwarz inequality it is a one of the most fundamental inequalities. Again I would like you to work as an exercise verify that this cauchy schwarz inequality becomes an equality only when the vectors x and y are parallel to each other is a very simple exercise and I would like you to uh, uh, prove it yourself to be able to understand the power of the cauchy schwarz inequality. Yeah, def, uh, um, um, uh, an extension of the cauchy schwarz inequality is called a Minkowski inequality. If p and q are 2 integers with the property 1 over p plus 1 over q is 1 then cauchy schwarz inequality can be extended to the inner product of x and y is equal to x transpose y is less than or equal to the p norm of x and a q norm of y. 
when p is equal to q is equal to half 1 over half plus 1 over half is 1 p is 2 q is 2 I get the 2 norm. So, the Minkowski inequality reduces to Cauchy Schwarz inequality when I pick the 2 norm. So, you can see the generalization between 2 norm, p norm, q norm, Cauchy Schwarz, Minkowski all these related properties of vectors. So, now that we have known that there is one norm, there is two norm, there is infinity norm, all these norms are related. I am not going to prove them, but you can readily see what does it mean. If I have a vector x, if it is if the norm of a particular vector x is finite in one norm, it has to finite in every norm that is what it essentially says. The length of the vector in a 2 norm is, is less than or equal to the length of the vector in 1 norm which is equal, less than or equal to square root of n times the length of the vector in 2 norm. Likewise all the other inequalities I do not want to repeat it you can read it for yourself. This essentially tells you that all these norms are intrinsically interrelated. So, what does this mean? This means that you as an analyst has total freedom you do not have to confine your analysis either to the 1 norm or 2 norm or the infinity norm or the energy norm. You can do the analysis by picking any norm that is convenient to you. If you can prove one result in one norm you can extend it to any other norm using these inequalities. So, that is the fundamental that is that is the, that is the fundamental aspect of this uh, uh, relation between various norms. Now, I am going to introduce the other concept which is called a functional let V be a vector space. Any function that mean that maps V to R, R is a set of real numbers. F is a function that takes a vector x as the input. So, let me give you a little, a little, little, little picture here. So, I have a box which is F, I give an x, x belongs to R of n it spits out a value f of x and f of x is a real number. So, what does it mean? It takes the vectors and converts them to real numbers. Any function that converts a vector into real number that is called a functional. Function is different from functional. It is a very technical term. So, I would like you to be aware of the intrinsic differences between a functional is a function, but not all functions are functionals. So, functionals are special cases of functions f is called a linear function. So, once I have a functional a functional can be a linear functional or a nonlinear functional. A functional is said to be a linear functional the emphasis is linear functional. If f of x 1 plus x 2 is f of x 1 plus f of x 2 that means it satisfies the additive property. It also satisfies what is called the homogeneity property f of a x is equal to a times f of x. So, any functional that satisfies these two properties is called a linear functional. Now, I am going to give you examples of linear and nonlinear functional. A norm is a nonlinear functional. Given a vector x, a norm is a number. So, a norm converts a vector into numbers, is a functional, is a nonlinear functional. For any fixed vector a, f of a mapping r into r, that means f of a of x is a times x for a fixed, that is a linear functional. Another example of a nonlinear functional, given a matrix a, Give, give, given, a, given a matrix A, uh, I can talk now about one half of x transpose Ax that is an example of a nonlinear functional. So, functions, functionals, linear functional, nonlinear functional, functionals defined over the vector space. So, vector space is the basis. So, you can think of a functional to be as follows a functional is here is a vector space V here is a real line r a functional takes a vector and maps it into a real number. So, that is how you can look at a functional mapping a vector to a real number. Now, I am going to quickly talk about the notion of orthogonality and conjugacy of vectors. Why do I need conjugacy? Later when we are going to do optimization we are going to be talking about conjugate gradient methods. So, I would like to be able to introduce the notion of conjugacy pretty early enough. So, let x and y be two vectors. We denote a vector this this one uh, uh, I am I'm sorry yeah ok good. 
this symbol has to be perpendicular like this I think my computer did not have that is perpendicular. So, we say x perpendicular y is equal to 0 to imply the inner product implies and implied by the inner product of x and y is 0. If the inner product to x and y is 0 I say the vector is orthogonal. Orthogonal vectors are denoted by this symbolism x perpendicular sign and y. So, two vectors are said to be orthogonal if the angle between them is 90. So, if this is x if this is y x this is y angle is 90 degrees. So, we say x and y orthogonal. Now, an extension of the notion of orthogonality is called a conjugacy. Two vectors are said to be a conjugate if x transpose a y is 0. Now, I can extend the notion of x a conjugacy to a set of vectors let x be a set of k vectors each of them in R n. S said to be mutually orthogonal if if I pick any two vectors x i x j it is 0 if i is equal to j it is not 0. So, we call it mutually orthogonal that means if I took any pair of vectors they are orthogonal. So, what is an example of any pair of vectors that is orthogonal you already know this example 1 0 0 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 we generally call this vector e 1 we call this vector e 2 we call this vector e 3 you already know e 1 is perpendicular to e 2 e 2 is perpendicular to e 3 and e 3 is also perpendicular to e 1. So, e 1 e 2 e 3 are unit vectors they are mutually perpendicular to each other that is the notion of mutually orthogonality. Then A is said to be orthonormal if any if I took if I picked two distinct vectors the product is 0 the inner product is 0. If if I pick the same vector and compute the inner product with itself then the, 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 the value is 1 in which case it is called orthonormal. Orthonormal means the vectors are normalized they are also orthogonal. So, what do I mean by saying the norm of x i comma now uh, uh, inner product of x i is equal to 1 that simply is equal to the square of the norm of x is 1 say that is what that what this means that is that is what this means that is what that means. That means vectors have unit length every two vectors are orthogonal. Now, if I look at my vector e 1 a hey, this is of unit length this is of unit length this is a unit length. So, I have examples of three unit vectors which are mutually orthogonal. So, this these three vectors uh, they are not they are not only mutually orthogonal, but also orthonormal. I hope you see the difference between normality and 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 simple orthogonality. The same set of vectors are said to be a conjugate if x i a trans x i transpose a x j equal to 0 if i is not equal to 0. The energy norm of x with respect to the matrix a square of it uh, if i is equal to j. So, this is an extension of the notion of mutual orthogonality mutual orthogonality. So, these three concepts orthogonal orthonormal a conjugacy of a collection of vectors is one of the fundamental properties of vectors that we would be very much interested in in our analysis. Now, I am going to introduce a very simple notion what is called what is called linear combinations of vectors. We will also have a lot of occasions to talk about this concept. Let x be a set of k vectors each of the vectors are going to be in R n. So, each of the vector so I have k number of vectors each of them in R n. So, I want you to distinguish two things the size of the vector is n, but k of them x i the ith vector has the n components the n components the ith vector is i 1 i 2 i n the first index refers to the index i of the vector x the second indices refer to the components of the vector. Let a 1 a 2 a k be, or the, be the real scalars. Let us define y to be the sum a scalar times the vector plus a scalar times the vector plus scalar times the vector. Y is simply sum of the multiples of each of the vectors. So, y is called a linear combination of the vectors x in I, I, I have. So, this is this is called the linear combination that is very fundamental uh, linear combination y is a 1 x 1 plus a 2 x 2 plus a k x k. 
what is the standard example of a, a linear combination? If I have a set of vectors x1, x2, xk, if I compute the average x bar 1 over k times summation i equal to 1 to k xi, a what is that? That is called the centroid. In geometry, we consider center of gravity. The center of gravity is the centroid. Centroid is simply a linear combination of vectors. So, I, this is an example of the notion of the linear combination that often occurs in, in statistics in many computations. So, the notion of linear combination is fundamental. Once I have the notion of linear combination, I am now going to talk about the notion of what is called linear independence and linear dependence. Again, this is another fundamental property from vector, vector spaces that one needs to be uh, very thorough with. Let x be k vectors. The set of vectors, the set of vectors in S are linearly dependent. If there exists a linear combination y defined by a1, x1, a2, x2, a3, x3, a and a k, x k, whose sum is 0, but the condition is that not all a's are zeros. When not all a's are zeros means even when I can I can annihilate them by I, I can annihilate them by picking by picking some of them to be not 0. As an example, if I have a vector 1, 0, 0, if I have a vector 3, 0, 0, you can readily see this is the vector let us say x 1, this is the vector x 2, x 1 I can say minus 3 times x 1 plus x 2 is equal to 0. Do you see that please? So, these two vectors are not linearly independent, they are linearly dependent. So, the notion of a linear dependence is very clear. So, when do I say something is linearly independent? The opposite of dependency is independence. Your set of vectors is said to be linearly independent if it is not linearly dependent. So, you define what dependency is and then say independence is something that is not dependent. So, the notion of linear dependence is, is fundamental is an absolute absolutely uh, 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 yeah, very it plays a very basic role when we deal with rank of matrices when we talk about solutions of linear systems and so on. The next concept is the notion of what is called span of a set of vectors. So, let us assume I am given a set x of k vectors in Rn. n is the dimension of the space, k is the number of vectors I had picked. I am going to define a concept called span. Span of a vector, what is that? It is a set of all vectors y, it is a set of all vectors y such that this y is the linear combination of the set of all vectors in S. So, x i's are all in this, a i's are constants. So, y is the linear combination of vectors in S and each of the a i's are real numbers, x i's are in R n. So, think of it now. I, I, have, I have been given a fixed set of, I have been given a fixed set of uh, numbers, uh, I have been given a fixed set of vectors which are x1 to xk. So, these x's are fixed. I have a choice in a's. Each of the a's are real. So, for each coefficient there are infinitely many choices. There are k such coefficients. So, there are k way infinity of combinations that one but that is possible. The set of all linear combination if you put them all together we call the span effect. So, that is called the set of all uh, linear combinations that have I will give you a quick example now. Let E 1 be the vector 1 0, let E 2 be the vector 0 1 span of E 1 E 2. Let us consider the span of E 1 E 2. So, this is the x axis x 1 axis this is the y axis. So, E 1 goes like this. E 1 goes like this, E 2 goes like this. Every vector in this space x can be replaced as x 1 times E 1 plus x 2 times E 2. We all know that right? Hey, any vector x 
here is equal to x 1 x 2. So, what does this mean x 1 times e 1 plus x 2 times e 2. So, any vector x is the linear combination of e 1 and e 2 therefore, the two dimensional space r 2 is the span of e 1 and e 2. I hope that is very clear to you now. So, the two unit vectors span the whole space. So, that is the power of the notion of span. So, clearly a span is a vector space and it is a subset of Rn. We say the span of S is a subspace generated by the set of vectors x. So, in summary what is the concept here using the concept of linear combination and by picking a set of k vectors I am able to define a subspace generated by a subset of vectors a subset of k vectors a subset of k, ve k vectors in here. So, that is the notion of a span of a set of vectors. The next concept is called the notion of a basis and dimension. You can really see I am not proving any of these concepts. I am trying to introduce all these concepts because you must be aware of these concepts. So, you should have a good access to a good book on linear algebra to be able to further explore these concepts, but I want to bring all these concepts to the forefront to emphasize this these concepts play an intrinsic role in the development of algorithms for data simulation. Data simulation as a discipline belongs to computational science, it is a branch of applied mathematics, it has a very deep roots in many of the different sub disciplines in mathematics. I am trying to expose such uh, 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 basis one would need to be able to do data simulation uh, thoroughly. So, I am now going to introduce the next concept called basis and dimension. Let, let us consider a vector space <coughs> V let B be a subset of the vector space. So, B is a subset of the vector space. I am now going to be talking about a particular property of the vector sub subset. If every vector, so what is the basic idea here? This is the vector space V, B is a small subset of it. If every vector x in V can be obtained as a linear combination of those in B, that means every vector in V can be expressed as a linear combination of vectors in B, then B plays a very basic role. B is very important because everybody in V depends on B. Such a subset is called a generator for V, the notion of a generator. For example, the two unit vectors E1 and E2 generate the whole two dimensional space because every vector in a two dimensional space is a linear combination of the two vectors E1 and E2. If the set of vectors in B are linearly independent, then B is said to be the basis. We already know the notion of linear independence. So, B is the basis or span of S. E i is the unit vector with 1 as 1 in the ith element and 0 elsewhere. So, that is called the ith unit element. B n the set of all unit vectors i 1 to n this must be i, i i is equal to 1 to n this is the capital I it must be little i. The set of all unit vectors is the basis for B of n. Therefore, you can readily see the n dimensional space is essentially created by a linear combinations of, 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 of vectors in the basis. The number of elements in B is called the dimension or the span of B. So, the, the dimension relates to the number of generators. So, what does it mean? What is the minimal number of elements that you need to be able to create the whole space? If I had n unit vectors I can define the whole n dimensional space. If I had two unit vectors I can define the whole two dimensional space. So, the notion of base notion of dimension and you can see readily see all these things are intimately related to the notion of linear combination linear dependence, linear independence and these are fundamental concepts relating to vector spaces. Now, I am going to conclude with a set of uh, problems which I would like you to 
uh, work and, 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 and extend your understanding. To be able to work some of these problems, you may need to consult some of the other books that uh, uh, describe all these methodology um, a lot more uh, uh, um, in, in, in clear detail. But I would like to, I have hit on major concepts one must be aware of to be able to pursue things to follow. So, verify the parallelogram law, verify the triangle inequality for the two norm, one norm and infinity norm these are very good mathematical exercises. Prove that the inner product is equal to the product of the norms if, on, if x, x and y are parallel vectors this essentially comes from the cauchy schwarz inequality. Using MATLAB plot the contours of f x when a when x transpose a x in other words f of x is x transpose a x. So, this is the quadratic function I would like you to plot the contours of this using a MATLAB. MATLAB is one such example you do not have to use MATLAB you can use Mathematica or any other software system that you are comfortable with. But MATLAB has very powerful graphics that makes the job of plotting al al almost trivial. Verify that if x 1 x 2 x 3 are 3 linear independent vectors that x 1 plus x 2 x 2 plus x 3 x 3 plus x 1 are also linearly independent. Let x be a vector 1 2 3 that means I am now giving a very specific vector with comp components 1 2 and 3. I would like you to verify the relations between the 1 norm 2 norm and infinity norm given in slide 12 of module 2.1 the module is essentially 2.1 in this in this particular module I do not have to even say the in this particular module uh, but the module number is 2.1 that is that is that is what I would like to able to emphasize in here. So, this is 2.1 with that I think we come to the end of the coverage. I told you you have to go into other books for further reading I am giving you three references one is a book by Golub and Van Lon that is one of my favorite I have a copy of that. I have uh, the second one is matrix analysis and applied linear algebra the third one is um, Horn and Johnson matrix analysis the third one is little bit more advanced second one is uh, quite elementary third as uh, first one is rather intermediary I have all the three copies of these books these are extremely useful anybody who wants to, to do fundamental work in data simulation must have at least one of these three my preference is two the book by Mayer published by Sam is an excellent book with primary emphasis on not only on matrix theory, but also on computational aspects of matrix theory. With this we conclude our overview of the basic principles of vector spaces. So, what are the basic things we covered vectors, norms, distances, um, concept of linear dependence, concept of linear independence, orthogonality, conjugacy basis dimension these are the nuts and bolts of linear algebra that you would need to master to be able to proceed further. Thank you.